Um, so I'm just going to try and make us a little bit lighthearted, sort of a lighthearted look at the, the amusing and somewhat hilarious ways that documentation can go wrong, um, particularly in the open source space. I would like to come to a bit of a point, if I can, towards the end, where I'd like to talk about uh, open source projects that you might be working on specifically and exactly how to attract writers to your documentation team and why you might actually want to do that. <coughs> so um, open source documentation in general, I, I like to refer to it as sitting somewhere on a scale from bad to awful. Um, it's not just open source though. Bad documentation is absolutely everywhere. <laughs> a lot of the time it's confusing, uh, but sometimes it's downright dangerous. This is an interesting example. Um, so many of these pictures are so many of these pictures are ter terrible resolution. But um, for those of you who can't see, it says caution: using command, which is the name of the system that they're using here, uh, may not divert your attention away from road and traffic. For starters, the typo distracts your attention. Completely. I'm pretty sure that is supposed to have two ends in it. Um, and also, the sentence doesn't say what they're trying to say, and is so convoluted and confusing that by the time you've actually worked out what it says and what you think they might have meant, you've probably already driven off the road. Um, so, not particularly safety conscious. Uh, there are some truly wonderful writing-related quotes out there. I've decided to try and pick some of my personal favourites. Uh, this guy... You might have heard of him. His name's Gerald David Freeman. He uses the pen name David Gerald. Any any bells yet? No? He wrote a couple of episodes of a little known science fiction show called Star Trek. Uh, that pen name, David Gerald, has its own pen name. That pen name is, if I'm correct, uh, Solomon Short. Solomon Short wrote some appallingly bad fiction. And other than that, he's famous for a few pissy quotes. Uh, this particular one says, I'm all in favour of keeping dangerous weapons out of the hands of fools. Let's start with typewriters. The point being, of course, that there really is some truly awful writing out there, which is absolutely hilarious when you consider how much of it he was actually responsible for. <laughs> um, while we're talking about dangerous weapons, I think even a typewriter could be dangerous if you held it <laughs> But considering we're talking about open source docs, here's one for some developer tools for PHP. Uh, there are four ways to start a session. Two are wrong. <laughs> because, like the previous example, there's nothing quite like telling people when we're doing things wrong. You are doing this the wrong way. Um, leads me to another one that I see over and over and over again in open source. You see it in other places too, but open source seems to be particularly bad, and I think it's a bit of self-delusion, actually. Um, I'll run through some examples, and hopefully you'll spot the common thread. Oh, blank screen. Simply open console. Simply open console. That's easy. Now, of course, if you're using KDE, finding the menu could be hard. But anyway. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to simply. Not only is it simple, it's also easy. Yay. Yay us. Uh, simply download the patch here. How many times have you clicked on a link like that, had it go to a list of patches that's longer than a Dan Brown novel, had it go to, <laughs> had it go to one or two links, neither of which seem appropriate, had a 404 or had some other, some other issue. Uh, simply type in the following <laughs> command as root. Um, A, you've got to know how to get into, get to root. You've got to understand what the command is, what it's doing, what the switches are, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, simply install the latest version. Simply install. Simply install. Oh, that's my personal favorite. We'll come back to that one. Let's deal with the three simply installs. Has anyone actually tried to install anything on Linux recently? Um, if it's not in a package manager, then basically, yeah, if you're not if you're not a highly technical person, you're pretty screwed generally. Uh, and this is my personal favorite right at the end. Uh, all unnecessary elements have been removed. For example, div class equals entry disappears entirely, and h3 class equals comment simply becomes h3. How simple is that? Why didn't we think of it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this guy's name was Edward Gibbon. He was a historian. He wrote a lot of Roman history. And he, uh, many years before the concept of open source obviously came up, he said this pithy quote, uh, unprovided with original learning, unformed in the habits of thinking, unskilled in the arts of composition, I resolved to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> which he did, which became somewhat famous, actually. But uh, My point being that in open source, we're all doing something necessary. we're not necessarily trained to do. 
Open source is all about pitching in. It's all about getting the job done. It's all about doing doing what needs to be done, essentially. Um, we're all being forced to adapt to our environment in very strange ways sometimes when we work in open source, which means that sometimes we have to stretch our skill sets in ways that they've never been stretched before. The problem with documentation, of course, is it's not always recognised as something that needs to be done until the last minute when all of a sudden you realise you've got a hole. <laughs> You've got a hole and you're going to have to plug that somehow. And generally what happens in that, um, that circumstance, we, we, someone, will, oh, someone will step in and, and do what needs to be done. Okay, that's it. <laughs> and um, quite often that job will fall to you know, the guy who admitted that he had some facility with a, a word processor or something like that. So um, the other problem that's present in open source documentation specifically, that I think it occurs in, in projects more, more, on a more general scale as well, is that of the amateur. Uh, you'll find that many projects have one or two seasoned, seasoned people that know what's going on, know where everything is, know what's happening and know what needs to be done next. And then you get a, a, a series of people marching through who are, who are brand new beginners and they're there you know, trying to help out. This is something that... Um, I'm guilty of as well. I know many, many times I've been coaching new writers or I've, you know, run into a writer in, in, on a mailing list or something like that. How do I break into technical writing? I really want to get into this. And I, my first thing is always go and contribute to an open source project, go and do some writing, have something to add to your portfolio. So I'm as guilty as the next person. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Obviously, we want to encourage as many people as possible into our, into our organisation, into our... Uh, open source projects to be able to contribute, but you do end up with this problem where you've got way, way, way more amateurs than the one or two seasoned professionals can possibly cope with. Um, of course, the problem there being what well, you've got one or two seasoned professionals and one of them gets hit by a bus, you've got the old problem where they've disappeared and now you've got 52 people standing around going, what do we do next? Um, so, you know, common problem. Uh, in certain professions, of course, it is natural to assume that uh, the people practicing them are skilled professionals. Uh, doctor springs to mind, uh, as does ACTA. Uh, and anything that involves sharp or particularly heavy machinery. Um, or pipe wrenches. Anything that involves a pipe wrench, for, for the most part, you can assume that they know what they're doing. I've got a pipe wrench at home. I'm very proud of the fact that I own a pipe wrench, and I've broken lots of things with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> most people basically would be able to have a good guess at what qualifications or what skills you would need to be able to become something like a lawyer or a teacher or a solar panel installer or a developer, for example. But writing is still very much a dark art. Uh, Technical writing certainly doesn't have the mystique of, say, a good horror writer or something like that. You know, we're not all Stephen King. Um, but it's definitely considered a black box. Uh, writing in very many ways is considered, you know, we give you content and you pump out some kind of documentation that we can give to our users. And that right there, of course, is the problem. Uh, people don't understand necessarily what skills writers employ. And because we're constantly surrounded by writing all the time, some of it created by professionals and some of it not, we tend to think that writing is something that anybody can do. I mean, we can all pick up a pencil, we can all write a few words, we've all done it millions of times before. Just because you can write, put words on paper, it's not necessarily the same as conveying a message though. So people do tend to figure that writing is easy. So you end up in a situation where the documentation becomes something of a hot potato. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, everyone knows that the documentation needs to be done. Nobody really wants to do it. It'll get passed around for a while. And eventually the guy who confesses that he knows a typesetting language will eventually be the one who ends up doing it. Or the guy who once sat next to somebody who did some documentation. Uh, you know, you get these strange kind of things happening. Uh, but basically, I, I said before, we're surrounded every day by, by writing. But good writing, good writing oh. isn't just about getting the right your. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it's not just about getting the right your. It's also about conveying a message or conveying information <laughs> in a way that makes sense. Uh, incidentally, don't you hate it when we get those raw tomato outbreaks? <laughs> 
<laughs> you can't read it. It says, due to the FDA, there is an outbreak of raw tomatoes. Uh, we will have to discard all tomatoes until further notice. Until. Until. <laughs> until. until yeah. yes. The random capitalization. I'll have to. Until yes. two hours. <laughs> yeah, the, it's, it's a piece of, it's a piece of, it's a beauty. It's a real beauty. <laughs> Another quote. This is quite possibly one of my favourite authors. Um, his name's Eric Blair. He was better known, of course, as George Orwell. Uh, he's most famous for giving us the notion of Big Brother, but he also left us an amazing amount of really good writing advice, um, which is possibly why he's my favourite author. But uh, his most famous piece of writing advice was an article uh, he wrote in 1946 called On Politics and the English Language. This quote comes from Matt. Uh, in certain kinds of writing, it is normal to come across long passages which are almost completely lacking in meaning. Uh, this may well have been true in 1946, Unfortunately, it's gotten worse. This is uh, a ZDNet article on a product that I'm actually documenting at the moment. I was doing some Googling around trying to, trying to find out what the, what the tech media was saying about us. I'd like to, to read it to you if you don't mind. <laughs> I'll need my glasses for this. So, um, CloudForms, which is based upon the company-sponsored Delta Cloud project that is now part of Apache, Offer sophisticated resource management, application deployment services, and infrastructure as a service offerings that help IT administrators implement private and hybrid clouds. It doesn't end there. <laughs> they go on to say, the platform consists of a cloud engine for high-level automation and abstraction services across multiple virtualization hypervisors and virtualized clusters, an application engine and system engine for comprehensive application lifecycle management across multiple cloud providers, and various infrastructure as a service offerings, including storage, messaging, and high availability services. I counted them. That is 778 words that mean nothing. <laughs> They mean absolutely. I know what cloud forms is, and it still means nothing. Email rolls not bad. I typed that. <laughs> I um, I've left the typos in for your own amusement. Uh, this is my next piece of wisdom. This guy is a web comic author. He wrote a web comic called Something Positive, which you may have heard of. Uh, his name's Randy Milholland. And he said that typos are very important to all written form. It gives the reader something to look for so they aren't distracted by the total lack of content. <laughs> in the I can't, I, I have to agree. It, it also easily explains most of the registers articles these days. <laughs> so let's explore this problem a little bit more. Another random children's television show random reference. Uh, in order to solve a problem, of course, we need to define what the problem is. Stop playing with your glasses. Um, that open source, of course, is difficult to define problems because open source is so many different things. Of course, it's more than just Linux. Um, one solution that applies in open source is never going to apply universally in open source. So let's take a look at the issues. There are, of course, two broad types. First of all, we've got the cathedral type. Most people would be familiar with the cathedral bazaar styling. Uh, this, of course, you've got the cathedral type. You have some piece of software that's been developed internally and then released into open source. Or you've got sort of the RHEL model, which is where they, they take something that's open, bring it in-house and develop it, and then release it back out again. Then, of course, you have the bizarre type. I love this picture. This is my smartphone. <laughs> uh, you have the bizarre type, which is, of course, what many of us tend to think of automatically when we say open source project. And um, that's where you've got some teenage genius with a great idea, manages to be able to, to convince other people that it's a good idea and they should contribute to it as well. So, of course, I can go on at length about how the Red Hat documentation model works in terms of cathedrals. Um, I will touch on it briefly, but I promise not to bore you all with Red Hat stuff. I'm more than happy to answer questions if you actually want to know later on. Um, Basically, the Red Hat model is they've got money, they hire writers, they hire the best and brightest they can find, they then train them, and, you know, we pump out some pretty decent documentation, if I say so myself. Um, of course, that's to be expected when you're pouring money in and you're pouring expertise into it. Uh, okay, so another interesting one that's more or less in the cathedral standard before we go on to money. Uh, is is, is LibreOffice. I call it cathedral. <coughs> it's probably somewhere in between, but we'll, we'll run with cathedral for now. 
Uh, they're uh, created by a seemingly endless stream of volunteers. Um, anyone who's been on the LibreOffice mailing list within the last sort of, 12 months probably would have noticed this. Uh, they're extremely susceptible to the newbie problem that I was, I was talking about before. There literally are about two people who, who, are, who are running the LibreOffice documentation effort. They are extremely good people. I've got a massive amount of respect for them. And um, especially Jean, she's, she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've got this endless stream of volunteers who walk in and go, hey, I've never written anything before, but I want to write something for LibreOffice. And then, you know, they go get in, they do a small amount, and then they, you know, you don't see them again. And that's, so that's a, that's a constant problem, there's this constant flow. But it works. In terms of LibreOffice, their documentation is great. Um, I, it has a lot to do with the fact that they're, they're their core people have been there for a long time. They're great documenters in their own right. Jean has um, has published a great textbook on uh, developing help systems, um, which I use as a Bible personally. So she's a very, very experienced people. They know what they're doing. And so it's working. They've managed to be able to take this endless stream of volunteers they've got and produce something really fantastic. The LibreOffice documentation is really awesome. Um, so let's move into some of the more bizarre style ones. I mean, bizarre with two A's in it, not two Z's, but anyway. Um, of course, one of the best ones for documentation is GIMP. Uh, GIMP has fabulous documentation. They've got amazing uh, tutorials and, um, yeah, the video tutorials and that that are done. Is there video? There's video tutorials as well, I'm pretty sure. Um, amazing, amazing amount of work there. I haven't personally been involved in the GIMP documentation project. I'm pretty sure they've got a fairly closed, anyone can enlighten me. Uh, got, a, got, a, got a fairly, fairly, fairly close-knit group of documentation people. They don't seem to have as many volunteers wandering in and out. Um, definitely working for them. It, it says a lot about what having a, a core group of, of good documenters can actually do for a project. It's nice to compare that to Inkscape. Inkscape uh, have taken a, an interesting approach. They don't do a lot of in-house documentation, although um, I did notice that actually they've, they've got a printed book on the way, I'm not sure what the story is with that. But Inkscape for a long time have had a really good and robust model over at Floss Manuals. Uh, the Floss Manuals Inkscape book is basically the Inkscape book. And uh, if you, when you go and look at the Inkscape documentation page, they basically say go over to Floss Manuals, that's our book. So they've actually, in a way, managed to outsource the, that documentation process. Um, of course, it is important to remember when we're talking about GIMP and Inkscape that um, that really is the cream of the crop, the ice cream crop. Is it maybe? <laughs> I just love that picture. I just had to get it in. Um, so they, they really are the cream of the crop. To get a more realistic view, I'd like to show you the documentation for a little tool I was trying to use not so that not long ago called Record My Desktop. Have you heard of this one? Yeah, a few people have used it. It's, uh, it's not a bad little program, actually. Uh, I have used it, I used it quite successfully for a conference I did earlier in the year, so I certainly can't knock the program at all. The documentation, however, uh, the FAQ was last updated in 2008. I took this snapshot about three days ago. Um, the, the FAQ was last updated in 2008, and the user guide was last updated in 2007, as was the man page. Um, I won't go into the documentation simply because we've only got 40 minutes. Um, it was a little bit woeful, shall we say. So we've more or less ascertained that documentation in general sucks, and open source documentation in general sucks a little harder. Um, of course, the problem then is what are we going to do about it? If you've got money, the problem is easy. As I said earlier, Red, Red Hat tends to throw money at the problem. We tend to just say, hire more writers, train them better. And, you know, for the most part, that works. Um, I would say if you've got money to throw it to throw at writers, that you would just basically pay a professional writer. Depending on the amount you're willing to give them and the type of person you manage to get, you're probably going to get decent documentation. Um, hopefully. Uh, of course, if you're in this happy situation, then um, the, the point of advice would be to go looking for a writer first and a developer second. Uh, I have seen so many technical people with no writing experience come into, into writing organisations and while they're great technically, they're not always great at writing. You, there, there does seem to be this conventional wisdom, especially in open source or especially in the IT industry as a whole, that you need to have worked with product for 
decades. You need to understand all the underlying technology to be able to write about it. And it's just not true. Um, I'd like to stand up here as living proof of the fact that it is not true. Um, I've documented many, many things that I haven't seen until the day I walked in. In fact, I've documented things that I have not even used. Um, and that is, it comes down to research, it comes down to the ability to be able to find that information, to know where to go, and the ability to be able to talk to people to extract that information out of people's heads. Um, the information is there in people's heads, sometimes you've just got to go and get it. Um, you don't necessarily have to have that knowledge of, you know, of your own in order to be able to get it out of other people. So you don't need to, you don't need to be skilled in the individual products that you're documenting in order to be able to document effectively. Put it that way. So yes, if you're throwing money at the problem, definitely make sure you get somebody who is a writer, uh, not necessarily an engineer, although having someone who has some kind of engineering felicity can be a good idea, obviously. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about um, writers. Uh, when, when, we approach a, when we approach a new documentation project, we, we approach it as a user, and that can often be a really good thing. Uh, we tend to go through the same learning curve that a user is going through as we're documenting it. If you've got someone who's been working with a product for 10 years, they're not necessarily going to describe it in an effective way because they're going to start at this high level and then get harder. In most cases, you need your documentation to start down here and then move up. So uh, I'd like to have a car analogy. What's open source without a car analogy? Uh, imagine you're a mechanic. Someone's asked you to describe a car to them. Uh, if you're a mechanic, you're probably going to go in and talk about how it converts fuel through the engine into energy so it moves forward. If they're an alien, you know, your typical alien from outer space, they've never seen a car before, what they really need to know is that it's a box on wheels that moves you to places before they understand how catalytic conversion works. Um, it's, it's basically just trying to say you, you need to start from the beginning. And the idea of having somebody who's not familiar with the product come in is actually a really good thing. So, um, of course, as I said, money isn't always easy to come by, so you may not be able to throw money at the problem, uh, especially if you're in the open source space, because, let's face it, who has money? Um, it's not to say that you can't get good writers for free. You definitely can. Uh, the good thing about writers is that we all have this strange... that we have to, we have to write. We have to write. We're writers. And if we don't write, we start getting the jitters. And we'll go home and start writing diary entries and blog posts and, you know, mad journals. And, and we get caught up in things like NaNoWriMo. <laughs> and anyone who hasn't heard of this, this is writing 50,000 words in 30 days. And people do this every year, thousands of them, every November. Sit down and try to write 50,000 words in 30 days for nothing. They don't get paid. I've done it three times. I'm just as nuts as the rest of them. We, we don't do this because someone hands us money. There's certainly no kudos in it because, I mean, it's not like you can put NaNoWriMo winner times three on your business card. <laughs> Mind you, maybe I'll try that next time. Um, yeah, NaNoWriMo is, is proof to me that writers write. Writers will always write. Just like haters got to hate, I guess. Writers got to write. So... Um, if you put a little bit of thought, there's some lessons to take away from, from NaNoWriMo. If you put a little bit of thought into the environment that you're offering writers in your project, then you can make them come to you and write simply because they think it might be something fun to do. Just like NaNoWriMo. We like to challenge ourselves. We like to write. We want to just pump out some words. Let's pump out some words in a way that's actually going to benefit people. So. Briefly, I'd like to, uh, to hark back to what I said earlier about Red Hat. There should be another slide there. Yes, there is. You're supposed to say, that's a lot of penguins. That's a oh, lot of penguins. Thank you. There's 90 people in the documentation <coughs> section in Red Hat at the moment. That's a lot of penguins. <laughs> oh, come on. That's funny. <laughs> Well, it was funny when I wrote it, which is about midnight. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a lot of penguins. It's, uh, we do have about 90 people in the documentation section. Uh, well over half of them are in Brisbane. Well over half of the 90 are writers. The rest are translators. Um, <coughs> somehow, we, 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 you know, we think we're doing it pretty well. We're not doing too bad. Our hiring actually hasn't slowed down at all, uh, even through the GFC. We continue hiring. We continue hiring in Brisbane, especially because that's where most of our writers are, are held. They let me out of the coop. <laughs> it's um, 
What was I going to say? So the reason why Red Hat continue hiring and the reason why we haven't slowed down hiring, the reason we've got 90 people doing this in a company that's only about 4,000 people big is because we provide a great environment for our writers. Obviously, there's that standard cachet of, I work for Red Hat, you get the red fedora, everything's cool, and everyone goes, yay, Red Hat. Um, so there does have that cachet of, I'm going to work for Red Hat. And I know I certainly felt that when I started, you know, the, yay, I get to work for an open source company, and they pay me. Um, so there is that, but also we provide a great environment. We train our writers really well. We spend a lot of time on personal development with our writers to ensure that they're improving, to ensure that they're continually up to date. And we let them play with all the latest, greatest stuff. They get to play with all sorts of cool things. I get to get, to get into play in the cloud space at the moment. And it's, it's just so much fun. I get to play with all this new technology that no one's seen before. And I get to sit in all these talks and hear people going, the next latest, greatest thing is this. And I go, oh, yes, I know all about that. <laughs> so we do provide a really good environment for our writers. And uh, it's, it is a fairly highly technical environment. So it suits the, it suits the geeky the geeky style of writers, which of course is what we want for tech writers. But we have a lot of fun. Uh, the Brisbane office in particular has a wee room. Uh, Friday afternoon, Mario Kart, four o'clock. Uh, you know, but this is standard kind of stuff, and this is the kind of environment that we're offering our writers. So basically, if you can put some thought into your environment, oh, I skipped ahead too fast. I don't think I'm ready for that slide yet. Um, if you can put some thought into your environment that you're offering your writers, then you can actually make them come to you, essentially. You can make it fun, you can make it interesting, and you can make them want to come to you. So here's my list of great writing environment factors. I'd love to hear what your, your ideas are and so we can try and hash out a little more because it's hard to, it's hard to pin them down into to little modular sections. But um, I think one of the main ones is to give writers the freedom. Give them the freedom to use... Uh, to, to choose which tools they want to use and give them the freedom to just walk away and work on the projects in their own, in their own way. Of course, when you're in a corporate environment, you need to, need to keep people to deadlines and that kind of stuff. In an open source space, you can generally say, look, I don't care which methodology you use to produce this documentation. Our due date is March the 2nd. Make sure you've, you've got it by then. Now go away and have fun. Build the team however you want. Delegate your responsibilities however you want. Give them that freedom. If you've always produced documentation in LibreOffice Writer or whatever, and you get some, some uh, tech writer walk in and say, look, I'd really like to convert this to Docbook XML, or I'd really like to convert this to LaTeX, or you know, every writer has their personal favorite, then let them do it. If they're knowledgeable enough to understand what tools they want to use, they're knowledgeable enough to understand how to make that transition, I see absolutely no problem with allowing them to do it. Gives them the freedom that they they need to be able to um, to be able to produce the best possible documentation, essentially. Um, on the other hand, of course, the flip side of freedom is to give people a, a simple structure and process. You don't want to tie them down, but in especially in the case of um, of newbies, you like to give them a little bit of structure and don't make them jump through hoops to be able to contribute. So uh, this, it helps you writers on the project get up and running, obviously. It helps those first, those first contributions to happen. And it, um, it helps people who aren't proven writers get started. So definitely with your experienced writers, give them, that, give them that freedom that I was talking about. For your new writers, make sure you've got at least some kind of structure there. Make sure you've got um, a fairly easy way for people to submit their first patch. Make sure that it's fairly easy to fix things like typos. Uh, because that's what people will notice. If, if, you're, if you're at all writingly inclined, no word, I just made a word up. Um, if, you're, if you're at all inclined to that kind of space and you notice typos in, a document, in documentation, you're going to want to fix it. It's that compelling need to, <laughs> to fix the documentation. If it's easy for, for people to contribute patches like that, sorry, is that a question? Yeah, just, I just, just wanted to say that if you do notice typos and there's a place to submit bug reports, Submit it as a bug report, please. It really helps. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, what he said. Um, but basically, make it easy to contribute. To contribute. So, I mean, always. I know all the Red Hat books have a link to Bugzilla in front of them, which lists the lists the component that you're supposed to list bugs against. It says something like, "We need feedback." You know, if you notice typos or errors in in this document, 
Razorbugzilla gives you the link and it gives you the component to raise it against. Something as simple as that can be all it takes to, to, to be able to give people the impetus. Um, lots of us see typos and we just go, oh, I'm never using that book again, it's full of typos, it's terrible, I hate it. Um, if there's something simple that will catch their eye, go, oh, maybe I can fix it. Then, I mean, it makes a massive, oh no, I just broke the presenter. Um, <laughs> why do I break something in every talk? There we go. Um, what was I saying? So yeah, make it easy for people to raise bugs, make it easy for people to make a, a first contribution. Um, things like keeping a, a simple to-do list of basic things that need to be done um, can be useful for the team as a whole, but can also be a good place for people who want to contribute to come in and go, oh, what could I do? Oh, I see, the installation guide needs a review. I can do that, that's easy. Um, so basically, provide that, provide that framework, but let people work within the framework. Um, a robust documentation team will pick up lots and lots of bugs. It's um, one of the main things that we're noted for within Red Hat is how many bugs we raise. Uh, because we're going through the we're going through the software in sometimes minute, repetitive, ridiculous detail. Uh, clicking through things, we will notice when buttons don't work properly. We will notice when you know behaviour isn't quite as expected. If you get a a silent failing or something like that, we notice that stuff. So we raise bugs. We also do things like notice typos in interfaces. Um, I've raised so many of those bugs over time. In fact, I've had bugs that I've raised three and four years ago for uh, for description files in uh, in package in, in pa the description file in a package um, that I, I've rewritten them years ago, and still I get this bug report going. Your bugs are now being closed. It's like oh, finally! <laughs> so I finally looked at the description and, and put in my my updated one. So um, uh, just recognise that. You know, your documentation people are actually really good people and we're doing good things for you. So make sure that, you know, we're raising bugs and we're, we're helping you out. And obviously, I mean, there's obviously all the other stuff that documentation brings as well. You know, the biggest one being, of course, less support calls, less supporting us. Um, but recognise that your authors are doing this stuff. Um, always make sure you acknowledge the work that the documentation team has done and not just as a generic, the documentation team. Um, listen. List them just as you would developers. It may it may seem egotistical of me, but writers are writers are just as important to the project, so you should should recognise them as such. Um, of course, the the flip side of that is that if potential writers are seeing that writers are recognised and valued in a project, they're more likely to come and, and contribute to your project as well because they see that they they will be valued. Um, and similarly to that, recognise writers as experts in their field. Uh, if you if you get told by a writer that something doesn't read well or that maybe you should consider rephrasing it, obviously you don't have to jump through hoops to make sure that happens. Um, the world doesn't work like that. You're allowed to negotiate. <laughs> but, um, you know, talk to them. Find out why. There's a good chance they've got a good reason and they'd be more than happy to explain it to you. Um, a lot of writers do have marketing or journalism backgrounds. Uh, a lot of us do tend to come from that field across into tech writing. So a lot of us have a pretty good sense of how to talk to end users, obviously, but also how to how to present ideas in a way that um, that there it's a positive message rather than a negative message. There's a lot of marketing in tech writing, put it that way. And if you ever need any help, even on simple things like um, taglines or any kind of packaging or your website content, all that kind of stuff, writers can help you with that as well. It's not just about the manual; it's about all that other stuff that wraps around it too. Uh, and finally. Probably the biggest, probably the, the biggest single thing I can tell you as, in terms of advice is to make sure you have a welcoming community. Uh, I know it's not easy. There is, there are a whole other conferences on this matter, so I won't go into too much detail. But um, as a as a job classification, writing doesn't suffer from the same gender imbalance that is present in the IT community as a whole. Generally, generally speaking, um, if you if you have a community that is not welcoming to women, that is not welcoming to minorities, then you are essentially cutting out more than half of the potential pool of writers you could have, and not just writers either. It's all other contributors too. Make sure you've got a welcoming community. Make sure you've got a code of conduct. Make sure you've got you know a, a friendly mailing list where people can ask stupid questions. Writers ask lots of stupid questions. I will tell you, and because we, we we tend to ask the questions that people don't like answering. Which is like, where's the forgot password link? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, oh, 
oh, we can write one of those. I did this just myself in a project about a week ago. We're going, I, I typed up the installation, the, the login instructions, and I, you know, had done the typical, so, you know, if you forget your password, you should, went, hold on, what should they do? Back to the UI. There's nothing there. There's no way of notifying if you've lost your password for, for a web interface. Um, you know, where's the forget password? And, oh, we haven't actually coded one. So, you know, they, they, yeah, they're hard questions to answer sometimes. You don't want people getting flanked for asking questions like that. Um, obviously, yeah, if you, if you don't have a welcoming community, if you're not welcoming minorities and women into your group, basically you're cutting down your potential pool of writers by at least half, if not more. And if you ask me, that's just kind of stupid. Finally, final quote. This is from a Polish writer with a name I can't pronounce. <laughs> I just like the quote. I'm not sure who he is. He's apparently quite famous in Poland. Um, advice to writers, sometimes you just have to stop writing even before you begin. Thank you very much. Questions? I was just sort of wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit on the tools, uh, especially for open source projects where you'd like to be able to check in the documentation, mm -hmm. some repository. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you'd like to be able to have multiple people work on the same piece of documentation and then merge it. Yep. So Word and even LibreOffice, I think, score fairly poorly on that. They. Um, because you basically can't merge the stuff. I think Alfresco handles the, the versioning as well. Have we got any LibreOffice contributors in the room? No. I like on the mailing list, so I don't tend to actually do any documentation for them. How sad is that? Um, I'm pretty sure their Alfresco system runs their versioning as well. Versioning is always a sore point. Um, it's it's hard to know which CMS to, to go with. Uh, Red Hat have an internal... We have a product that we developed internally, which I've spoken about conferences before, so some of you may have heard this one. Um, it's available in the Fedora repos, of course, everything we do is open source. But um, we, it's called uh, Publican. So Publican's the actual system that we use to develop. It hooks into our brew, to, which brews our packages. <coughs> so, but we actually just run, it, that, run that with SVN. So SVN handles our, our versioning. And we just do standard check-in, check-out, just, just like the developers do. Um, we have some in SVN. We have a few, few projects using Git. But for the most part, we're just using standard versioning system that, that any development would use. You don't have to have, I, I don't think there's a, there's a need for a, a proper documentation CMS, especially considering there's not really any good open ones. Um, I didn't necessarily do that, I just did something like in a blog book, hmm. where you can just have the XML file and just check it in beside your code. Yeah, but we, we write in doc book XML, and I mean, obviously writing in, in something like XML, SVN is perfect for it, it works really well. and. Um, yeah, it, there's, so this is, I know there's a lot of combinations. I'm sort of hesitating to say, yeah, you should use X because there really isn't a good answer. And that's where I'm saying give your, give your especially your senior writers, uh, the freedom to be able to choose those kinds of things. So there's just a question at the back. Is there going to be too much of a barrier to entry if I confront a technical writer with something like uh, restructured text or marked down so that I can integrate? the documentation into my build systems and, and my source control as a coder? I think it's possible that you could scare some people away by saying, yes, you must write in LaTeX or whatever. You know, there are people who will come in and go, ooh, that's a bit frightening. But if you, know, if you can have some stuff, I mean, you might have readme or something like that that have been developed in writer. Um, you might have other stuff that people can contribute to. I mean, obviously, man files are man pages are more or less text files, so they're easy to edit, um, and it's quite easy to hand a hand the text file back to a developer and say, "Here, make that a man page for me." <laughs> you know? So you can take that technical aspect away. However, any any technical writer that's been doing tech writing for some time will be at least marginally familiar with either XML or something that can produce XML. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, yes, you mentioned the four conditions which are nice for writers. Mm -hmm. I know that one of the most satisfying things with anything, be it writing or coding or anything else, is knowing that people are actually using your work or Absolutely. reading your documentation. Um, what have your experiences been with getting to know, getting feedback that yes, people are actually using this, um, or, or failures thereof? I think I, I think the biggest one is you know when you get a bug when you get a bug report. I yes. mean, obviously, most feedback you're going to get on documentation is negative feedback. 
Um, however, for me personally, the biggest piece of feedback that I got that meant something really huge to me was I, um, I, I'd gotten into work, I say gotten into work, I'd logged into my, my IRC in the morning, and we're just getting into work when you work from home. So I, I, I popped in and someone pinged me almost instantly. I said, Lana, Lana, you're, all, you're, you're internet famous. And I'm like, what? What's going on? And I'd actually been listed as uh, one of the top technical writers on the web um, by somebody who I respect, a technical writer in Canada that I respect immensely. I actually managed to meet for the first time a few months ago. And um, he had been reading some documentation that I'd worked on and had been reading my blog as a result of that because he Googled my name and had sort of had this weird feedback loop come come around through where I got listed as one of, one of the top technical writers on the web, which I thought was really cool and I still list it in my resume. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, obviously that kind of thing doesn't always happen. It's always nice to get those kinds of feedback. Most feedback you're going to get will be negative. It'll be, I found typos in the mm. documentation or whatever, but at least you get that personal satisfaction. Someone is actually reading it. Yeah. Some Someone's looking at it and using it. Um, I know just recently, uh, for those of you who have heard of the OpenShift product, um, it's one of our new cloud offerings at Red Hat, and um, it's now got, on our Red Hat documentation page, it now has the second highest number of hits after the RHEL documentation, and there is one guy working on that project. He, well, not anymore, he's just gotten a couple more people, but at the time, he was he was the one person working on that documentation, and he crowed about it around the office for, for weeks. <laughs> you know, I've got, this, I've got the second most popular documentation on redhat.com slash docs. So um, he, he was he was pretty proud of himself. So that when that kind of thing does happen, obviously you get some metrics back, you get a bug back. Yeah, you get that satisfaction. For the most part, though, I, I walk around saying, you know, I'm I'm a writer. I, I've published oh, probably well over fifty books in various versions, but nobody's read it, ever read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question over this way. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> mostly, it was just a barrier of entry thing. One of the open source projects I've been involved with is um, is called XC Sort, but like you never have any other game. Document runners, because all the people who are interested in doing documentation runners have nothing to do with technology at all. They're all pilots, they're like the builders or whatever, because that's the thing that the community is um, just not like an IT community, we're yeah. all like minded. Yeah. And um, you talked about using our own tools, and we actually tried that at one stage, trying to get them to use other tools to do it. And even we even tried to do it on Google Docs, because traditionally and currently, all of our documentation is in LaTeX and in Git. Oh, well, yeah, like that can be a bit frightening yeah, exactly. for the layman. Well, yeah. we're actually starting to go back there because the problem is, is that the documentation of those tips are really long, and there's mm. lots of them that keep coming in. <coughs> and, um, but the main barrier to entry, that's, that's a part that I, I've always said to them, just send me an email, I'll just take the text and cut the paste it in. Don't worry about the formatting. But the main one is that they get scared that they don't know how the product works. Yeah. And that's the one I keep telling them, that's good, that's the other person, like you said, but yes. they just won't believe you. No, and it, it can be really daunting, especially stuff that is highly technical. Uh, it can be really daunting to, to walk in and, and go, oh, I don't know anything about this, what do I do? And of course, that's the difference between an amateur writer and someone who's been doing it for a while as well. See, I, I tend to approach those, I mean, I, I did definitely when I started out. It was, it was they, they handed me this, this messaging middleware stuff when I first walked into Red Hat. <laughs> Any of this. I've been writing in LaTeX for a few years, and so I felt like I knew LaTeX. And then they said, "No, you've got to write it in Docbook XML." I'm like, but I don't know Docbook XML. I don't know this product. I don't even know what middleware is. You know, so <laughs> let alone how to document any of this stuff. So yeah, I I know where you're coming from. See, whereas now I'd walk up to them and go, "Yeah, a new challenge." Well, maybe um, like a one page, one web page. Why amateurs in your product? Amateurs <laughs> I, I wonder if it'd be worthwhile switching over to something more simple in terms of actually being able to produce documentation. So it's switching over to something like getting a document in writer, provide some templates or something. Like the problem is that's the question we've asked before: is how do you merge when you've got ten different document writers? There's different people giving all the time, so you can't use those as an X. My yeah. Docker works, LaTeX works, but Writer doesn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah I know LibreOffice have, have the same issues with version control. Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a hard one. I think you've just sort of got to work with the, the community to be able to yeah. figure out what works <laughs> kind of thing. I, I, ideally, you'd have someone come in who sort of, you know, knows the terrain and knows what they're doing and isn't going to get too frightened off by the whole thing, but it's hard to find that person too. Um, I mean, I, I talk about the, the newbie issue with having too many newbies coming in and out and only one or two core people. If you don't have those core people, then the whole, the whole thing starts to fall apart, unfortunately. You've just got to try and find them. 
I think. Um, it may be worse even trying to get contacts through writer types that you know yeah. to, to try and branch out, you know, see if you see if you can attract, you know, some someone more someone more experienced into the team. And there's a question at the back somewhere. Someone got a question at the back? Yeah? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so we're coming on the very end of everything. Mm. I've been up recently and they might be able to have link providers who have an ability to, in the browser, um, modify the code using uh, some sort of JavaScript editor and then commit it back again to the oh, platform okay. right there and then. So you don't actually have to download it, you don't have to check out any code. Um, you just do that and then apply this to the <coughs> and then people Oh, okay. I think there are some other decent version control, like the, the simpler yeah. version control systems. I'm trying to think. So we especially good things like typos and stuff where you really can't be bothered checking out a whole bunch of code, a whole bunch yeah. of presentation and then modifying and then committing back to when you respond to it. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely stuff out there yeah, to use. You could. That's that's another option, and it's definitely the way a lot of lot of people are going is to is to have a wiki. <laughs> um, there's a really. I'm coming back to you, Miriam. <laughs> there is there is a really good uh, real time wiki. I was documenting some real time stuff not all that long ago, and they they've got a, a really comprehensive one that I use so much just to get basic terms straight in my head and that kind of thing. So yeah, wiki documentation is definitely an alternative. Go, Miriam. Um, I was just wondering if there's any sense of when things like open source is a sense of community and collaboration that's sort of GitHub. Um, this GitHub Yes, I get to go to parties and introduce myself as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I still work out what I really do. There's a lot of people out there that aren't, um, you know, aren't compelled to write, don't mind writing, but they still want to contribute to the can be really good because it depending on the, the wiki model that you choose you can have comments or talk pages or whatever that, that will provide that kind of feedback um, I know within Red Hat we're talking about moving to a model that will allow popular content to bubble up to the top um, and will allow more dynamic linking and comments and that kind of stuff to be able to I mean obviously because it's better for the users but also because it, there's that that inherent feedback loop in there um, in, in terms of Wikipedia uh, trying to attract more women, um, I find that an interesting one because it really does just come back to the point about having a more welcoming community, I think, um, which of course is a big issue that's a big bundle of worms that I'm going to try not to get into at the moment. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's so much you can do and so much it's hard to do and um, it's, it's a hard problem to solve, but I think that's probably where the Wikipedia problem sits is uh, in making themselves a more welcoming community and making themselves a bit more open and available to, to everybody, not just <coughs> white males in North America and 25 to 35 age groups. <laughs> um, yes? As a white male in the 25 to 35 age <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm in a position where I've written a whole lot of code and I'm like, oh my god, last minute I've got like two hours to document the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so obviously it's not going to be enough time. How do I best approach it so I don't end up as an example to others in the next one? Yeah. <laughs> um, basically there's some positive um, things. Start earlier. <laughs> <laughs> start earlier would be my, my first piece of advice. Um, 
With two hours to go, uh, I would suggest not writing very much um, and just hope to God that your UI is going to carry you through at least for a little while. When you write under construction, you have an anime. They're coming back in, you know. The anime is so good. No, the construction Yes, that's frightening. I think yeah. last year was one of those gifts that that 1993. Yeah, people are, yeah, aren't familiar with them. Um, in terms of writing in a very short period of time, I mean, I have had those kinds of horrible situations where you're, you're three days before GA and all of a sudden you've got to develop a prop up and say, oh, by the way, we decided to include those features we told you we weren't including. Um, you need to write a couple of chapters. <laughs> You know, and sometimes you do just have to do the late night and get it in. Um, sometimes you have to release something that's good enough. Um, many, many, many times I've released things that I would barely consider good enough. Um, you know, it happens, yes. Uh, the trick is to try and, I guess, how can I best put this? To simplify, to, to make it short and sweet, to try and, to, you know, cover the basics. Make, make sure people can get it installed. Make sure people can get it started. Um, make sure there is a, a link in there so people can contact you. Make sure that the documentation says something along the lines of, yes, this is still under construction. <laughs> um, you know, please, please check back kind of thing. In the meantime, please email me or, or please, you know, raise a bug here or whatever. Um, you're just going to have to cop the extra support. That that's going to that's going to create. Sorry, don't have a good answer. <laughs> Were there any others? Do you have some some kind of like procedure that's the, where you have uh, a person who has no idea how, how to use your documentation when they take your documentation and, and follow it step by step? Apart from you, because you you already know it when yep. you're writing the documentation. Yep. Um, we actually have a fairly rigorous review process that we use in Red Hat. I assume that's what you're. No, I, uh, rather, rather or just in general. So, 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 some, some, somebody completes uh, uh, a <laughs> story, you know, like, like uh, you, you yourself, mm -hmm. when you were writing about middleware at the start. Mm. Uh, some, somebody, after you've finished writing the instruction, do you try them yes. on, some, on somebody who has no knowledge? Absolutely. Oh, okay. um, in general, I'm, I mean, I can go through how Red Hat do it if you like, but in general, I would say. Um, if you're a you know single documenter on a small project or whatever, yes, you finish writing it, and the first thing you need to do is put it down and walk away, go have a drink, a couple of stiff ones, <laughs> come back, you know, as as much time as possible, leave it for, come back, you know, a, a day or two, or even if it's just an hour or two, if you know, depending on the size of the project, obviously, if you can put it down and walk away and come back, that will always help. Follow your instructions, actually, do everything. Um, try to read nuance into it. Um, try to try to work out where you've you've assumed you've, you've made assumptions about your audience. Try to work out you've made assumptions about steps. Um, follow your procedures rigorously to the letter. Obviously, it's always good if you can get someone else to do that. Um, look for the word simple. Look for the word simple. <laughs> Seriously, break through your document for the word simple and remove it. <laughs> the problem with simple, I didn't go into detail, but the problem with simple is there is always going to be somebody who does not find it simple. And what's, what's going to happen is they're going to sit there and go, but they say it's simple and I can't do it. And it's usually because they're missing a dependency or something, you know, something further back in the steps. It's not that they can't actually do that thing. They can't click the box or they can't, you know, the box might not be there. So it's supposed to be simple. Where's the stupid box? And what ends up happening is that they just feel dumb. And what we don't want is to make our users feel stupid. We really, we want them to feel smart. I mean, we want them to feel good about themselves. And we, we want them to go, yeah, this documentation's great. It helped me get there. And it didn't make me feel like an imbecile. Um, you need to, yeah, take the simple out. It's that simple. Just take the simple out. <laughs> it's not always simple. It's simply a matter of using grep, if you say. <laughs> yes, simply, simply use grep. Simply use grep. So probably a follow-up of statement to the last question was you know, with, with companies' conferences, there's always talks on testing and code and things like that. Um, can we test our documentation? Better? Absolutely. Our documentation actually goes through quality engineering just the same as our as our products do. Um, all our code goes through QA. We, we like to call it QE because we just like to be different in Red Hat, so it stands for quality engineering. 
Um, so we, we QE all our products, we QE all our documentation as well. We actually have product QE, which are the guys who work in each individual product, and we have documentation QE, the guys who work specifically with our documentation. Most documentation, in most cases, in most projects, will go through both. Um, product QE will check for things like technical accuracy and to make sure that our procedures are actually, you know, what we're telling people to do is actually what we want to tell people to do. And documentation QE, uh, they get angry at us if we leave typos in because we're supposed to find the typos, but they will find typos if we leave them. Um, they will look for things like uh, making sure we're handling trademarks and other legal entities properly. Um, they will check for consistency and parallelism to make sure that the chapters are laid out in similar ways and to make sure they've got that red hat feel. You know how marketing people like to talk about look and feel? Do you know um, Very little. Very little. Uh, surprisingly. So we tend to run a spell over it and other than that we just hand it to QE and say, here, go, have fun. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I actually had, actually I think it was at OSDC last year, I gave a talk on tech writing and I did have someone in the audience, I hope he's not here, um, I did have someone in the audience ask if it, um, why we put our documents through um, human translators, why we didn't just use Google Translate or something. And, uh, I just sort of went, have you looked at Google Translate, like have you done the Google Translate thing when you, you know, put it in Portuguese and then put it back or whatever? <laughs> yeah, there are reasons why we have human translators, believe me. <laughs> a, single, a single language person for me, I don't Yes, I, I think so. I'm not sure what the gentleman's background was, to be honest, or I'm not quite sure what the impetus behind the question was either. Um, I had a feeling there was some subtext there that I wasn't getting. It seemed like an odd question. Yeah. yeah um, It'd be really nice if we had that. We don't. Um, I, not that I'm aware of. There might be out there, but. Um, just as I'm interested in that, related to that, there's two tools um, in the GNU project, uh, diction style, mm -hmm. that give you things like the reading level of this text and how well it reads and stuff like that. I, I, find, this, you know? I, I find this to be really interesting, actually. I wrote, I wrote an assignment once um, for my tech writing degree, actually, and um, it came back with an average grade level of something like 23. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure grades don't actually go to 23. <laughs> <laughs> I well, well, it was grade level. It's supposed to be equivalent to school grades, but oh. school grades only go to what twelve? So I think thirteen well, in some school cases. Grades, oh, so this is something. Possibly, yeah. yeah but I don't have a PhD. It's not where I managed to write it. So. <laughs> I don't know. I do. I do find the the first King K and all those kinds of things. I mean, I've I've, I've actually one of the things they teach you in tech writing school is how to work out those things manually. Um, for some bizarre reason, this is apparently something that's going to be useful to us in our careers. And, um, which, I mean, I almost immediately forgot after the exam, I might add. But um, I find them to be really weird indicators because depending on which tool you use to measure, like which measurement tool you use, you'll get wildly varying answers. And I think, I think it's because, I mean, all it really takes into account is things like the average word length, average sentence mm -hmm. length, average paragraph length, it doesn't take into account you know, the kinds of words you're using. I mean, if you're writing a highly technical document, you're probably going to end up with something that has a reading level of, yeah, grade 23, um, simply because you're dealing with long words and long concepts <laughs> and, and complicated, convoluted concepts that take a lot to explain. So I, don't, I, I find them to be kind of nominal. They're quite, I guess they're useful if you're writing a school essay or something. So you're kind of looking at I don't think anyone could understand that. I don't think it's possible. Did you notice that first block that I put up was one single sentence as well? Um, it was 778 words. I'm pretty sure it had two or maybe three sentences in it. Um, it's not as long as the sentence card I handed out at the last OSDC, yes. if anyone remembers that, um, which I think was 90 odd words in, the, in a single single sentence. Um, yeah, 
there's, there's some weird ones out there. And that, that sentence, if, if you remember, um, actually had nothing to do with any of the stuff that talked about what it was, what it was introducing. So, I should, I've actually got some of them floating around, so I actually bought them. Anyway, I think they're trying to kick us out. I just saw a person sort of do this. So thank you very much, everyone.